So let me convene us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word of thanks to everybody who made help make today happen. A particular thank you to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, and Dean Lisa Sullivan, who is the intellectual architect of today's event. Thank you all. Today is the start of our biennial symposium on teaching public health, split across sessions over three weeks. We are in a moment which has redoubled the importance of how we teach public health. COVID-19 has shown the need for a public health infrastructure that can support a healthier future once this pandemic has passed. Academic public health is core to creating this, helping to shape the rising generations of public health professionals, giving them the tools to build a healthier world. And it is, of course, deeply timely we should come together for a conversation about today's topic, how diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice can inform our teaching and the world our teaching aspires to help create. Recent months have made it painfully clear these values do not yet inform our world to the extent that they should. Getting to where we need to be starts with learning from each other through a process of engagement and conversation. I very much look forward to such a conversation today, to learning from our outstanding panelists and from you, our community. I am now pleased to turn over the screen to the architect of this event, our Associate Dean for Education, Dean Lisa Sullivan, who will introduce our speakers and moderate this afternoon. Lisa, over to you. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. That okay? Okay. Yep, looks good. Okay. Is it in presentation mode? Okay, there we go. Um, thank you all for joining. Welcome to our Dean Symposia. And uh, as Sandra said, this is uh, a quarterly event that we do at the school, and this is focused on inclusive teaching. We had planned an exciting day together, but unfortunately, given the circumstances, we've shifted to online, so we'll do our best to make the most of our Zoom time together. So this is our second Teaching Public Health Symposia. The first was in 2018, focused on teaching public health, and it resulted in this book that's shown here, a collection of best practices in public health teaching with contributions from educational leaders around the globe some of whom you'll hear from throughout this particular symposium. The book talks about public health education across the continuum, from high school to community college, undergraduate, master's, doctoral, and lifelong learning. It includes sections on innovations in teaching, including course design, engaging students, practice-based teaching, teaching by the case method, and so on. So if you haven't seen it, uh, please get a copy if, if you are so interested. So like many of you, I have the opportunity to do lots of things, research, administration, teaching, but my far greatest privilege is teaching. And it's so nice to share this space with others who I know feel the same way. So today's topic is around diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice in public health education. Kofi Annan said, education is the greatest equalizer of our time. It gives hope to the hopeless and creates chances for those without. Unfortunately, that's not always true. So what we wanna focus on today and over the course of the next few sessions is how we create good learning spaces for all students, provide each student equal access to learning, promote mutual respect, appreciate differences, combat implicit bias, engage in difficult conversations, welcome, support, and value all students as they learn. It's now my pleasure to turn over the session today to my friend and colleague, Yvette Cozier. She is Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion here at the Boston University School of Public Health. She's an investigator on the Black Women's Health Study. Her research interests include social and genetic determinants of health in African-American women particularly the influence of factors such as racism, neighborhood socioeconomic status, and genetics in the development of cancer, cardiovascular, and pulmonary disease. She also teaches two courses at the school regularly, social epidemiology and quantitative methods for public health. She's an award-winning teacher and beloved by our students. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Yvette. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, I'm not going to uh, linger here too long. I want, want to turn this right over to our, um, our guests, our panelists. So first, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Erin Driver-Lynn, Dean for Education 
uh, at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Driver Lin. Thank you so much. You know, when I was invited to participate in this panel, uh, none of us could have foreseen the circumstances that, that we would be in. Um, I'm sure like all of you, the past nine or 10 days have been uh, horrifying and, um, and uh, a, a, an important reminder of how much work we, we have to do. Um, and, and it's been stressful for so many people that I, I care about, I'm sure for you all um, too, on top of uh, the uncertainty from, from the pandemic and the economy. Uh, so as I mentioned to my fellow panelists, as I was preparing for um, this session, I started trying to put together some, some slides as per usual. And um, the format just seemed to me to be too much uh, business as usual and not really um, allowing me to feel as uh, authentically as um, I have been feeling the past um, week or so. So I decided to just present verbally. Um, and I want to say from the outset that I feel when it comes to uh, inclusive teaching, self-conscious and um, aware of my inadequacies of, of truly understanding what it means to, to um, experience racism. Uh, but I want to thank my panelists for um, including me in their company and to uh, thank Lisa and, and Sandra for inviting me. I'm grateful to be included in part because um, I feel responsible and, um, and as an inadequate as I feel I want to own that responsibility. Um, so what do I mean by that? I guess by way of, of analogy, uh, I understand why it's so important that our, uh, our diversity uh, committees tend to include more people of color than the, um, the populations that we uh, typically see in our faculty and in our classrooms. Um, and I understand why, why that's important and why that is, but I also feel like here I am a part of a system that um, marginalizes people of color and also part of a system that asks people of color to be responsible for providing solutions. And um, I think uh, all of us have the responsibility for trying to, to provide solutions and generate solutions. So I appreciate the chance uh, with a great deal of, um, of uh, humility. Um, the title of the session, Inclusive Teaching, assumes that we share a kind of value of, of diversity of points of view as integral to part of our education. And I think if you're in this audience, you probably do share that assumption. And it's certainly something that I believe in very, very strongly. So with that kind of uh, assumption that diversity is key to um, to being uh, good educators and key to public health. Um, I want to talk about three very hard problems and a few concrete solutions um, that, that I've seen work for addressing them in pedagogy. Uh, and I'll say that my framing of those three very hard problems are more in terms of social psychology, which is my, um, my training, than, uh, than in terms of, of public health. And it's informed by work that uh, I've done with colleagues on campus, um, our presidential task force on inclusion and belonging from, from teaching and from watching a lot of uh, amazing teachers and, and some that are really struggling. So um, each of these problems to me represent significant and kind of fundamental barriers to us actually reaching our goals for diversity in education. The first is that um, so many voices aren't heard. Uh, they're unheard or silenced, um, disregarded, dismissed, isolated or marginalized. Um, and other voices are louder uh, or, or magnified or amplified or seen to be more important. And that's true in academia broadly, but it's also true in our, in our individual classes. And to me, um, the, the, uh, the, the fact that many voices aren't heard is kind of overdetermined. Like we've got 
some very um, strong psychological forces that are at play. Uh, you know, all people stereotype and, um, and stereotypes really are used in how we think and behave in, in the world. Um, in psychology, there were some really amazing studies done in the area of nonverbal behavior where you put, um, they're called point light studies, you put points of light on uh, particular parts of the body and you, that's all that you see as somebody is um, shown moving. And in, you know, fractions of seconds, we can tell all kinds of things from just a point light study. So not, you know, you can see you often gender, you can see confidence, you can see all kinds of things. We take in so much information and have so many assumptions and stereotypes that come with uh, that information that just comes in so quickly. And we use those heuristics to, to make shorthand uh, assumptions and, and begin to, to act. Um, other uh, early psychology studies that have really been on my mind over the past um, bit of time, you know, the uh, minimal group effect, you can, you can take a group of people and you can randomly assign them to A or B and they will show preferences once they've been assigned to uh, a group um, for the group that they're, they're in group. Uh, they'll uh, provide resources to um, their group rather than the out group that quickly just by saying A or B or red shirts and blue shirts. And, um, you know, there's those early studies of, of conformity in the Milgram studies. You know, there's so much that is at play in, in the fact that voices aren't heard. Um, besides that, we have a lot of structural uh, issues in uh, the academy. Um, it's not a flat organization. None of our our institutions are flat organizations. They're very hierarchical. And at least in, in my, um, you know, wonderful institution, uh, Harvard, it's, uh, it's filled with people who perceive themselves to be guided by, um, you know, not being status conscious, by caring more about reason than about status, to being very democratic and let and yet people seem incredibly hyper aware of, of status. Um, and even the language we use to try to address inequality in education is othering. I mean, I've, I don't have answers. None of us, I think, are really clear about this, but diversity, inclusion, and even belonging, it, it feels like with the whole inclusive teaching, we're asking people of color or people who are marginalized in other ways to, to get included. To, uh, to assimilate. Uh, so you have all these forces that are really pushing against um, hearing from all voices equally. But um, some of those same powerful psychological forces can work in favor. Um, and I think the key for me in thinking about these sort of concrete pedagogical strategies for dealing with this issue of, of not hearing from so many voices that we really should is that um, anonymity is at odds with social engagement and kind of social accountability. So the, the more that we're able to, to not have people be anonymous, to, um, to de-anonymize, to allow more voices to be listened to, um, to make sure that every learner is known, the more that we um, are able to use those powerful psychological forces in, in positive ways. So the concrete strategies on this big problem for me are um, pretty simple, like learn your students' names. Even in really large courses, really large courses, there are ways to learn people's names. And uh, you know, someone on an instructional team ought to, ought to know, every, everyone should have their name be known. Somebody ought to know their name. Another very concrete um, thing is to, to do short, simple pre-course surveys. Um, use that information about where people are coming from, what their backgrounds might be in class. You know, if you have the richness of people coming from all over the world, be able to understand that and use that in your, in your class. And, and I, I think that that can work even with um, you know, more objective kinds of disciplines. 
um, you know, uh, statistics as opposed to things that are more on the um, epidemiological side. Um, so uh, third thing, developing ground rules for the classroom, actually involving students in the development of those ground rules, uh, helping students to be able to uh, have a voice in what the ground rules might be for um, uh, discussion and engagement. Um, and creating the space and structuring very well designed ways for students to get to know one another. Um, and, and I think making input on the part of every student routine and normalized part of every class, you know, there's some very simple techniques um, used to get feedback. Uh, one of them is called muddiest point. Um, you know, if you ask at the end of every session, what is the muddiest point of the, of the course session? Is that, it, it, is that uh, you know, what is the most confusing? And you have this kind of routine normalized ways of getting engagement and feedback from every person in the class. And then you track and review them. You're demonstrating so much that um, I think simple ways to make sure that every voice um, is heard. So second, um, second big problem, um, our curricula tends to be narrow. And, um, you know, it assumes the value of a, of a typically a, a privileged point of view that has, is part of a history. Um, and, and that's not wrong necessarily, like any, any canon represents a point of view. And, um, and having a point of view is, is, is perfectly fine. But I think many of our students aren't exposed enough to the content to be able to put that point of view into a context and really understand that it is just one point of view. And there's lots of discussion about this in, in subjective fields, but I think even in, in objective disciplines and even in the most basic things we do, we are um, making decisions uh, and um, privileging some information over others. You know, even the format of a table you're, decide, you're making dis decisions about what comes first and, and what gets put in rows and columns and what doesn't. Um, in a math course, what to teach first or second. So, you know, I think um, recognizing that we are just, we are voicing a point of view and providing ways that our students can, um, can, can get a, a grasp of the context of those points of view uh, is important. I met with a group of students um, at uh, the Harvard Chan School that helped to organize a, a decolonizing global health conference. And they suggested to me that every faculty member ought to on their syllabus, not just list the readings that they wanted to assign, but list all of those readings or, or give some sense of all that weren't on the reading list. And that struck me as an interesting idea, but entirely impossible. Like you couldn't, you couldn't possibly put on the syllabus all of the things that aren't going to be covered. Um, so uh, the the other thing that is um, structural about this, um, you know, our curricula tending to be too narrow is discussions in faculty groups about the curriculum can get. Like what should be required and what shouldn't be required can get really rancorous. Um, it, it's so much like a statement about what matters, what is part of the canon, what isn't. So it often gets avoided and our curricula tend to just kind of stay in, um, in uh, the way that they have been for, for, for too long. Um, so concrete uh, strategies, um, giving agency to learners again, um, so even though the syllabus idea that the students provided seems impossible, including a range of readings and saying to the learners, you know, you decide which of, of this set um, and, and then using those choices in the way that we uh, engage the students in discussion. Um, I've seen it work that rather than framing discussions of curricular diversity and the need to change our required curriculum in terms of whether it includes the right voices, framing it instead of does the curriculum prepare our learners to advance equity in the world we live in today? 
or doesn't it? And getting people to get outside of their own disciplines and really think through, are we preparing our students in our degree programs um, to advance equity in the world we live in today? And then a third um, concrete strategy in, in case-based courses, really thinking hard about the background of the protagonists. Um, a lot of cases, uh, instructors are using the, the great cases that have amazing content, but they really haven't thought through the protagonists and the players that are used in those cases um, enough to, to, uh, to make it clear that they're, they're sort of thinking hard about the curriculum. Final third problem, um, creating and nurturing the brave and safe spaces for difficult conversations. It's, it's challenging for pretty much every human. Um, anger is scary. Um, there are plenty of reasons for people to be angry um, and plenty of reasons to feel defensive. It's just hard to deal with that. Um, you know, structurally, again, trying to think about the structural issues. Institutions of higher education, research and education programs involve at their heart discriminating between one thing and another. Um, grades are a discriminatory system. Um, and we, in addition, uh, I think we tend to feel shame when we betray our ignorance, when we fail, even when we're doing something difficult. And you know, that's what's required for, for learning is uh, betraying ignorance and failing. Um, and uh, rectifying our mistakes when we say something wrong or hurtful is also very hard. And uh, it's especially hard in an, in an unforgiving sort of information age. So concrete strategies, um, I think adopting a listen to hear, not a listen to respond um, approach. Uh, professors profess and we are used to responding, but um, you know, really practicing listening to hear and not listening to respond at least at, at first. Um, modeling, um, a culture that sets high expectations for our students and high expectations for ourselves is, is really important. If you, to me, I always imagine a kind of two by two. And if you think of students on one axis and instructors on the other and uh, expectations to challenge being low or being high or being low or being high, what you'd really like to see is that both students and uh, instructors um, have high expectations to be challenged. And I think we lapse into expectations of, of setting a high expectations maybe for students or sometimes even not setting high expectations for students. And if we, if we really modeled mutually high expectations for doing the brave work of learning together, um, I think it, it, it would be uh, a, a very good step towards modeling. So those kind of high, high learning, um, high, high expectation environments. The last concrete thing I'll say is that uh, I think anytime we see that, anytime we see examples of that, even if it's not in our courses, if it's uh, just in, the, in our educational spaces, we gotta call them out and value them. You know, it's hard to do that difficult work of, of creating and nurturing brave and, and safe spaces. And so when we see it happening and we see those kind of high, high expectations, really validating them. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Driver Lynn. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Janice Bowie. She is the director of the Dr. PH um, in Public Health Program at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. Bowie. Thank you. Uh, and I want to, uh, to thank you, Dean um, Cozier and Galia and Sullivan for um, the invita invitation to participate today and to be on the panel with these other um, great uh, presenters and I certainly follow um, 
some of your work and 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 um, really support you all very strongly. So I'm going to try and share my screen. I also am going to start a timer so that I'll stay on time um, and, and make sure the other presenters um, have their fair time. So let me uh, try and get to my screen here. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So um, as we give our talks, we um, are now encouraged to use our university's template. And as Dr. Cozier said, um, and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, I am a professor there in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society, but I also run the schools, direct the schools, um, school-wide DRPH program. So I'm kind of talk a bit from um, that perspective. Um, and so I have just two slides I want to share. If I can get the slides to go. Okay. You might be at the end of your deck. Yes, you might want to go back to the front. There you go. Oh, yeah. Sorry. There we go. Here I am. Sorry, very, very sorry. I didn't even realize I was at the end. So um, as the theme for today talks about um, the issue of inclusivity, um, I want to sort of talk about, um, first of all, this idea of um, inclusivity, which I think um, is very much related to both interaction and to engagement. And um, Moore's framework, I think, does give us some clues, um, and, and it follows along with what I um, recently just heard Dr. Um, Driver Lynn speak to. But what I want to kind of focus on is how this, this notion of learner to content and learner to instructor um, and instructor to content really does lead us to meaningful learning and, um, and that we have to take all of these um, factors into consideration when we are um, thinking about instruction. What we know, and particularly in the DRPH program that I direct, which is part-time um, and, a, a, an online program for the majority of our students um, is that we are now really having to understand what are important engagement techniques for online learning. And it seems as though engagement is an important role in stimulating online learning um, today. Um, and I think that we have to really consider interactivity in the sense of community um, as it results in high quality instruction and more effective um, outcomes. The other thing that I think that is um, useful about this, this structure is that while it illustrates several factors that we can take into account, what it excludes are some of the important factors such as sexual orientation and preference. Um, students with intellectual disabilities, race, culture, all of these which impact the learning environment and how we engage as well as provide instruction shows up in student evaluations um, which have implications for, for all of us. I think that as tuition costs increase, we're gonna also need to think about who is able to gain entry and who will be our students? And how does learning and meaningful learning play out um, for them? I also want to say that um, for schools of public health, it's really important for us to reiterate that we are a multidisciplinary enterprise and that we should always have a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, I, I lastly, I want to pivot, if you will, um, from what 
is important in the way of engagement for instruction to that of thinking about not only this issue of inclusion and interaction and engagement for our students, but that it is also very much closely related to, uh, to um, our policies, a reflection of the policies of the universities for both students as well as for our faculty. And as uh, um, I think um, Dean Sullivan pointed out that you know, we are in this moment and um, I was recently sent this, um, this piece, which was just, as you can see from the date, May 28th, was just recently published. But I think it does speak to, um, to what is important for us in our institutions if we do, in fact, want to have engaged students, if we do want to have learning and structure for our students that, um, that resembles inclusion and, in, and, and authentic engagement. So I, I just want to spend a minute to sort of think about these issues, particularly for me as an African-American woman um, in um, a university that is, has the same level of prestige as those um, who are, are presenting today, as well as the panelists, that for us and for me, um, we are in this time where, you know, we are facing not only the pandemic of the coronavirus, but it's also a time where we are having the pandemic of racism. And um, and I think that what it also represents for us as we watch you know, people being gunned down today, you know, we have watched the memorial service of George Floyd, you know, we've watched multiple memorial services, we've watched all sorts of senseless violence and senseless killing, but yet we still are expected to sort of contain the rage, contain our fears, to continue to live within this let the state of embodied stress. Um, and yet we still have to show up and function and, and appear as though, you know, life is normal um, for us in, in, in these academic spheres. I think we also have to be aware of those microaggressions. And as the previous speaker just said, that we have to call those out. Um, and we have to acknowledge them that these microaggressions that we experience as, as faculty of color are microaggressions that we not only experience from faculty and even sometimes the administration, but microaggressions that come from our own students. And so I, I, I just want to further say that um, the unspoken and the indirect feedback that we get from students puts us in this posture of having to always prove our expertise, our worthiness, um, to continue struggling with things like the imposter syndrome, you know, which we all know is a result of the systemic undermining of our own professional esteem and, and how our research is valued in the larger hierarchy of the schools or our university's research portfolios. We have to start, we have to also try to figure out how to find work life balance. Um, we are often limited in inclusion in key departmental and school decisions and, and, and in other areas as well. And so I think this conversation today is one that is very important. And I think that. It's one that we're having, but I don't think that we can only talk about the education of students um, without also thinking about the, the, the faculty who um, are oftentimes um, like myself, who have to con teach, conduct research, serve on committees, et cetera. And often we are doing this 
and we don't necessarily look like or represent the races, the ethnicities, or the cultures of the majority of the students that are in our institutions. So I'm going to, um, to stop here because I am at the end of my time. Um, and I look forward to um, hearing from the other panelists as well as for um, the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowie. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to call on um, Dr. Regine Decroix. She's an assistant professor of sociomedical sciences and assistant dean in the Office of Diversity, Culture, and Inclusion at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Decroix. Hi. Um, so my last name is uh, pronounced Diacqua, but I know a lot of people struggle with that. I'm so sorry, Diacqua. That's okay. <laughs> Um, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So this is the land acknowledgement that we read at Mailman before events, um, just before I share any words. I am in Brooklyn, New York right now, so I'm still on Lenape land. But as I read this, I encourage you to think about the native land that you are on. We owe our existence and vitality to those before us who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted, and some have been brought against their will. We are gathered on the occupied and unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape communities, their elders, both past and present, their descendants, as well as their future generations. We sit in spaces funded, governed by, and named for families who derive their wealth from the transatlantic slave trade and plantation slavery. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the enslaved African peoples, their elders, both past and present, as well as their descendants and their future generations. Columbia University acknowledges that it was founded upon the exclusion and erasure of many indigenous peoples and that slavery has been intertwined with the life of the college and the university. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, violence, slavery, displacement, and migration through ongoing education and responsible representation. So thank you so much for that introduction and for having me here. Um, as Dean Cozier said, I am the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Mailman School of Public Health, and I'm an Assistant Professor in Sociomedical Sciences. Um, I want to talk today um, about one major key um, that I think we should all be thinking about when we are answering the question, what should we be doing around DEI and teaching? And then I'd like to talk about some of the initiatives um, and programs that exist at Mailman. Uh, so for me, the main thing when thinking about DEI work is that first we need to all realize that this is inside out work. And that will make sense to you um, as I get through my remarks. This is about adaptive versus technical work. So this is a concept from organizational development. Technical challenges are challenges that are easy. They are a quick fix. They can be easily resolved and are met with little to no resistance. Resistance is key in distinguishing between adaptive and technical challenges. Technical challenges do not require that we change our fundamental assumptions, beliefs, or values, and they can often be resolved using existing structures, policies, and procedures. So examples include uh, changing composition, so increasing numbers when we're thinking about the demographics of our faculty, staff, and student population, changing syllabi, changing policy. These are technical solutions to technical challenges, easy, quick, face, quick fixes. This is not what's going to bring us to the kind of inclusive and equitable institutions that we want to create. Creating inclusive institutions requires that we approach this in an adaptive manner. Adaptive challenges require shifts in our worldview. We cannot be more inclusive if we're not examining 
the beliefs, values, and worldviews that lead to the kinds of structures, policies, and procedures that impact the student experience and the overall learning and working environment in our institutions. It also requires new skills and approaches and new metrics for measuring what success looks like. So we have metrics to think about how we are meeting certain goals. Those are technical metrics. We as institutions need to think about new ways of measuring success if success means changing our worldview so we do not reify the systems of oppression that have brought us to where we are today. You know that this is an adaptive challenge because it's always met with very serious resistance and that resistance takes many forms. From organizational development, we know that most serious challenges are adaptive challenges. This is something that we have to remember and this is what I mean from working inside out. So we have to start inward, individually, to think about how we are situated within a matrix of domination before we start changing syllabi and doing all the technical fixes. To sum up, practices that have marginalized certain groups for generations requires transforming our culture and our worldviews starting from the inside out. This means transforming ourselves, the beliefs, values, and assumptions that we hold as our actions flow from our beliefs. Working from the inside out means that we move from awareness to commitment. That means that we must be working from social justice, anti-racist frameworks that will help us to analyze and interrupt systems of oppression. At Mailman, we've built on Patricia Hill Collins's Matrix of Domination, um, and talk about um, systems of oppression and how they manifest building on that matrix of domination. So we're constantly pushing our students, faculty and staff to think about how oppression manifests at the ideological level, the institutional level, the interpersonal level, and also how we internalize it. At this time, the inward work, the inside out work means that white faculty, students, and staff, faculty, students, and staff with memberships to groups that have been privileged in our society need to do very serious work to think about how these systems of oppression intersect with other systems of domination within themselves. They need to think about how they are bringing this into the classroom and how that therefore affects the academic experience what this looks like in practice. So I wanna share a few examples with you. There are a number that I could share, but I wanna be mindful of time. So we have a workshop for incoming students called the Self-Social and Global Experience or Self-Social and Global Awareness. And the point of this program is to get students to begin thinking when they set foot into our doors about their own socialization into oppressive systems. So reflecting on their identity in relation to power and privilege, thinking about how their socialization is ongoing and how while they are at mailmen, this is the time to interrupt it before they go and work in communities, many times communities that they are not from. For our TAs, um, our teacher assistants, we also have a workshop on creating inclusive classrooms, during that workshop, I focus on the significance of social belonging to academic success um, and strategies for creating inclusive classrooms. Our faculty also intend an inclusive pedagogy institute. During this faculty institute, faculty explore the adaptive and technical challenges to creating inclusive classrooms. And then we discuss approaches to inclusive pedagogy. Um, and this is an interactive workshop and a lot of the, and all of the workshops are interactive. A lot of the work is about having folks dialogue and often, which to be completely honest because of my own positionality and what I'm faced with day to day is a shock to me. Conversations people have not ever had. In addition to these workshops, we review our curriculum in a number of ways. Currently there are parts of our curriculum um, that are undergoing a type of analysis. I don't wanna use the word audit, but we are looking very closely given our aims 
to think about where things can be changed, where things can be added, and also bringing the student voice into this, being that they are the ones uh, enduring our curriculum, and in many cases, enduring microaggressions through that curriculum. Uh, on a larger scale, we are working to examine all aspects of the learning and working environment. That's a longer project. We have implicit bias workshops. We have um, hiring committee workshops. Um, and then two tools I wanna talk about um, are the bias response system and the equity protocol. And so we have a bias response system, which is an online system. Um, and I know that Harvard Chan has this as well. Um, and this is a system where we stress to our community that this is not a punitive system, but it is a system for learning, meaning that those on the back end are your own faculty and, and staff. Um, and the way that we deal with notifications is to think about how we can help the person who has been reported, um, how we can help all parties involved and harmed, and what this means for curriculum and workshops and other trainings. The equity protocol is a tool that I share with faculty in um, encouraging them to tune their curriculum for equity. I encourage faculty to share their work with colleagues in their departments and across departments. And I, I, I share a set of questions that I ask them to share their curriculum materials um, when they're sharing it to share the questions with their peers. Some of the questions include, what do you see that could be considered bias in the language of this assignment? Is the information contextualized? Who is at the table? What voices or experiences are, are excluded and why aren't those voices and experiences included? How can we include those whose perspectives have been silenced historically? In what ways does your content contribute to marginalization? What do you see that would meet more than one learning modality? How does this work serve all of our students in the field of public health? Now, I say all of this to say we are doing a lot of ongoing work. We have not figured this work out. We have our own problems and we are facing them daily. And so this means in every aspect of program and policy in the conversations that we have, we are calling people into the work making clear that this is not an ODCI, Office of Diversity, Culture and Inclusion issue. This is everybody's issue and it is your responsibility to carry this work forward in your respective units. Broad picture, while I am in my office and I'm faculty in a specific department, my work is largely thinking about all aspects of programming and policy to make sure that we are a truly equitable institution. We have a long way to go but again, it starts inside out with the adaptive work. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was, uh, that was amazing. And I'm looking forward to our Q&A around that. Um, uh, I would like to uh, uh, bring on uh, Dr. Linda Alexander at this time. Um, she is a senior associate dean for academic student and faculty affairs at West Virginia University. And she is the chair of the ASPPH diversity and inclusion section. Dr. Alexander, I think we, do we have you. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Galea, Dean Sullivan. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I wish I had some very sophisticated, profound reason for not being in my order on the presentation, but the time was wrong on my calendar. Um, and, and I apologize profusely. But what I knew from the preparation of this panel is that you would receive a very sophisticated and high level commentary from my colleagues on inclusive pedagogy. And so what I want to do was bring your attention to the mindset that we often have when creating the course syllabus and detailing in that syllabus how students will earn credit. And again, my, my colleagues have given you some very sophisticated language to think about this. And I think what will happen now is that I will bring this down to its simplest form and inspire you to think about decisions you make about course uh, content. So could I have the first slide, please? Oh, 
Oh, we okay. have Dr. Alexander's slide. Yeah, I, I see. Okay. Here. Okay. Um, when I began teaching in the 1980s, we used phrases like culturally relevant teaching rather than inclusive teaching. At that time, there were a myriad of well-meaning examples in course design that reflected what the syllabi developer deemed culturally diverse, inclusive, equitable, and minority focused. That list of culturally relevant material often included a reference to ethnic groups during lectures, inviting a person of color as a guest speaker, readings that focused on an underserved population, and a very bold statement containing the university's template disability language. If those things sound familiar, I'm glad you're listening. I so appreciate this series and being a part of the public health textbook project at BU because we're often lulled into a sense of accomplishment around these topics without spending any dedicated time to reflect upon what are we actually assessing and measuring in a teaching experience and how those decisions can foster or hamper a more inclusive learning environment. Next slide. So what are you actually assessing uh, for credit? And if you'll click on it again, you'll see that I've highlighted a couple things. I'm gonna chat about a few things I've prepared as part of a bulleted list, but much of my focus uh, this uh, evening will be on the group project. My colleagues and I have used humor as a coping mechanism during the current crisis. One evening, as I searched for the next priceless gem on Pinterest, I came across a site featuring funny yearbook posts from high school seniors. Ashley Noreen, a beautiful brown child wrote, when I die, I want the people I did group projects with to lower me into the ground so they can let me down one last time. This post resonated with me, not only because I was preparing this talk, but I had flashbacks over the number of undergraduate and graduate students I've taught who've expressed a similar sentiment. Over time, I've experienced how group work can be disastrous. Not all of this has occurred during my teaching. Much of my perspective comes from adjudicating situations of group work gone awry during my time as an administrator, and not because of the usual suspects. If I'm honest about some of the missteps in my early classes, I recognize that those who often emerge as leaders during group projects do not include others' perspectives, ignore other team members' points of view, do not appreciate differences in work habits, and ignore opinions about the final product. Instead, choosing to do all the group's work. Here's a variation on a theme. Dr. Alexander, I'm an A student. I can't afford stragglers and people who don't work as hard as I do. So I did everything myself. And that way I could be certain it was excellent. And I don't think it is fair that everyone share in this A because of all my effort. We are emboldened by our claims that students will need to work collaboratively as part of their job expectations when they leave the academy. And therefore we feel strongly that group work facilitates the real world experience of managing, leading, negotiating and performance on a team. But is group work as part of your classes always an inclusive experience for the student? Are we ignoring invisible barriers that prevent the group experience from being positive? Do we truly understand group dynamics in the context of inclusivity? And these questions are redundant in light of what I've heard tonight in terms of what my colleagues are inspiring us to do. I would suggest that if you value the group project as a legitimate assessment activity that demonstrates a variety of competencies that you make the formation of groups part of the course experience. And this is some of the work that my colleagues have alluded to in terms of preparation for beginning a class. I have some go-tos here. I'll name a few on the first day, make student introductions, part of the group activity, guide the process so students can share what they consider unique uh, they are experts on themselves, have students complete brief leadership style questionnaires, personality inventories to understand more about how their particular strengths can enhance the group experience and final outcome. Have students share results of their questionnaire and explore the salient features of each as part of your lecture. 
create homework that extends the knowledge of group dynamics, permit students to work with those they know. I'm reminded of Beverly Tatum's work, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Assign students to groups according to their own assessment of how they will master some aspects of course information. Uh, designate roles and responsibilities early on in, in, in the class to make adjust, adjustments. And think about grading members for their individual comp contributions and give a group grade not dependent on the contribution to the group, but how their unique piece or perspective enhance the final project. Ideally, this could be determined by students within the first few weeks. And I have, I have some examples of those um, that I'll share uh, later if, if we have time. I spend time talking about this because regardless of the intention, putting students in groups and requiring a final product dependent upon their individual contribution represents the construction of many, com many communities. These communities will emerge with various experiences with mainstream culture. So you need to be prepared to manage these accordingly. And I, I think we've had some excellent exa examples of projects that are ongoing in other institutions where they're doing just that. Two other examples of being mindful of inclusivity when designing your course and preparing the syllabus are assessments for class participation and attendance. Be certain that class participation doesn't become a barrier to inclusive teaching by insisting that students communicate verbally or raise their hands to show you what they're, that they are listening intently to your lecture. What you actually may be rewarding with point values are those who are very comfortable in their own skin and are a part of a society that embraces that as well. And students who are very comfortable uh, expressing themselves as a part of a large audience. West Virginia's abrupt shift to virtual teaching left us with several lessons learned. An important, important lesson relevant to this topic includes the addition of mandatory attendance in the syllabus. Again, what are you actually assessing? Mandatory attendance can be a booby trap for some students have lived experiences that include raising children, siblings, caregiving, working as part of the family business and or undesirable family dynamics to name a few. Bandwidth and connectivity issues may be a part of this, but inclusive teaching requires an understanding of the aforementioned in terms of students' ability, not only to be present in a seat or in a, on a screen, but to actually be present for learning. Many of our students who returned mid, home in mid-semester were required to be present during a teach-out that involves synchronous course participation. We learned that there are often significant barriers to focusing on schoolwork and exams from home. Asynchronous options might give students an opportunity to quote unquote attend while their involvement in family dynamics is reduced. Also for residential classes, students from some diverse backgrounds have competing priorities and the closer their tribe, clan, family, significant others reside to the university, the more they have to balance these priorities. Next slide. I'll quickly highlight a few more and if there's an opportunity for questions, uh, we can certainly come back. Be intentional and thoughtful with building your course around scholarly activities. And I think our last speaker alluded to this very eloquently. Whose scholarship are you valuing? Do you highlight thought leaders that look anything like those uh, who are valued by my kin? When providing examples of health disparity in your lectures, do you tend to reflect the same race and ethnicity of the disparate group as some of the minority members of your class? Who do you invite or quote as an expert around community-based practice or participatory research? Last slide, please. Also be conscious of course length when invoking highly sensitive or politically charged topics. And again, I think we're, we're hearing um, great examples of why that is part of our responsibility. But it is irresponsible to cover information on the syllabus for a 50 minute class and then leave the last five minutes to debate the state of the world. Many of our students have anxiety about COVID-19, um, but also black genocide. Your students represent faces, people and experiences you can't see. They don't take off a cloak representing all they are when they enter your lecture hall. Are you providing a space they consider safe when encouraging dialogue? Similar to our responsibilities to research subjects, you must do no harm. 
my colleagues probably have already discussed more about self-preparation for instruction. But if you are not comfortable with facilitating difficult dialogue, acknowledge what is happening in the world and then provide a list of resources, both internal and external to the communities that may take advantage and then make it your responsibility to get ready. It is important to be intentional in your course design to embrace differences in cultural experiences, ability to manage learning materials, approach to learning, physical attributes, mental bandwidth, orientation with mainstream cultural expectations, lives that matter. And in the context of current events, obviously all of these suggestions will depend on and be shaped by the number of course credit hours, required course assessments and your resources. Decisions about what counts for course credit are not innocuous. Constructive pedagogy begins with a broad understanding that we entered the academy with bias and preferences and that these may be unconsciously operationalized as part of our course development. I leave you with the notion that while my position affords me an opportunity to be included in many spaces, how often do you think I experience being included, but not belonging? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'm um, going to uh, go to the Q&A and there are a couple of questions there. And uh, the first question from uh, Mansi Varma is, uh, my question is for all speakers. As a woman of color with a learning difference, how do you suggest changing a social system that is based on traditional standardized tests and traditional standards of intelligence? And anyone can jump in if they'd like <laughs> on that one. Can you hear with, Can you hear me on that one? Um, okay. So, you yes, know, asking, sorry, can you ask yes. me one time? Sure, sure, I'll do that. Um, as a woman of color with a learning difference, how do you suggest changing a school system that is based on traditional standardized tests and traditional standards of intelligence? And so this is what the DEI work is all about, right? Um, and, and I think looking at how aspects, any aspect of your institution and its practices can further marginalize groups that have historically been excluded from higher ed is important. A kind of equity audit is important and thinking about the different ways that people learn, um, different modalities of learning, uh, learning disabilities is a part of that conversation. So how do we make this, this education accessible? There are the quick technical fixes, obviously, talking to your office of disability service, making sure that you have certain accommodations available. Um, now thinking, particularly in this Zoom area, being Zoom era, being vigilant about that, but it's part of the larger conversation about how we make this conversation equitable. I think having two marginalized intersecting identities may make it difficult for you to feel comfortable about saying something about this, but I think speaking to someone who is going to advocate for you or can leverage their privilege in any way would be very important in bringing this concern to the forefront. Um, I'm sure that you are not the only one who is experiencing this and that there are many people kind of suffering in silence. Would anyone else like to <clears throat> add to that? I will say um, in the meantime that uh, one of the steps towards equity was that BU SPH, we dropped the GRE as uh, in um, through that equity lens, but um, I, I'm also wondering if this question um, uh, sort of applies to the the very standard ways that we administer in class assessments as well. I I also wanted to just say um, in response to to the question that. Um, and it depends on the institution in which the person is in, because in some disciplines, 
um, as you point out, Dr. Kozier, the conversations are happening around um, GRE testing. So mm -hmm. they, the, so I would also suggest to the questioner to start to, to look for places where that is happening, um, to try to get a better sense of what, what has led to those conversations and also continue to look for points of access for where you can have those conversations because there may be others even within your institution that are feeling similarly. Um, I think it is a heavy lift. Um, it is, um, I think, challenging because it's, we, we are trying to, to break down things that have been so inherent and so systemic and structural, um, you know, just has been there so pervasive for so long that it is not going to be a quick fix. I think it is going to take time, but we have to continue to fight the good fight. And I encourage you to continue to, you know, to call it, call it out when you, when you can, um, when, when there are situations that will allow you to, to utilize your voice, um, I, I, I encourage you to continue to do that. I think it's a very difficult, um, tough question. I think it's one that has stumped all of us a little bit, but you're, you're probably in a group of people that are probably much more like-minded than you think. Um, Dr. Diafwa? I think it's also thinking about and, and pushing people to think about learning objectives and whether the assessments that we have are actually helping us to meet the, the, the purported learning objectives. Um, and so I think a lot of the standardized measures of assessment have been adopted and maintained simply because they're what we're used to. And quite frankly, they do not um, assess the kinds of competencies that we are prizing moving forward. So it is a time to think about how we change and what assessment looks like. And it's also important to adopt principles of universal design for learning. Thank you. Um, there's another, the next question. Um, it's actually uh, the next two questioners ask, uh, I'm gonna combine them, but uh, from uh, Dr. Bernie Harlow and Sue Wolf Fordham, uh, can you please elaborate on what is meant by leadership questionnaires? Um, uh, that students should complete to help determine group work. And so I think this was for Dr. Alexander. So there are a number of personal, personality inventories and brief uh, leadership style questionnaires. Now we can debate uh, during another webinar about how salient and um, uh, the validity and reliability of these tools for what you wanna use them for. But there are some very quick assessments that students can take. Um, if, you, if you Google personality questionnaires or go online, I don't wanna uh, misrepresent or, or advertise uh, one, but if you Google that, you will find that there are a number of in-class activities or out-of-class activities that students can um, complete that will tell them something about their learning style. Um, and that might also re relate to the earlier question um, where what you're, what you're doing is embracing the different ways that people learn, whether you um, learn more, are you a verbal person? Are you a visual person? Are you a big picture, picture person? And there are a lot of names for these type of uh, you know, questionnaires, depends on which one you use. But the important thing is to do the disclaimer about what, how, how this is gonna be used as a part of assessing group work. And you know, who is the creative person in the group that values uh, their, what their creative contribution might be over something else. And there'll, there'll be different um, you know, categories that you can um, put people in that don't distinguish good, better, best, but rather allow people to embrace their approach to uh, learning. And, and, and completing work. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, uh, going back to uh, what Dr. Uh, Driver Lynn um, in her presentation, and it was on the topic of uh, anonymity. Uh, so learning students' uh, names and, 
learning every student's name. Um, how has this helped or um, harmed uh, in the era of distance learning now? Well, since, um, and, and maybe you want to go back to, I mean, maybe Dr. Driver Lynn wants to first answer, uh, respond to your question. Um, and, and I'm certainly happy to, to add to that, um, Dr. Cozier, but uh, let me first give her that. that sure. Opportunity. sure. Uh, please, Dr. Bowie, go, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to, to chime in afterwards. The only thing that I was going to say is that um, I think, one, we have to be mindful of what the restrictions are, you know, the FERPA restrictions for what we can say and what we can't say and what we can ask people and what we can't ask um, people and, and, and people, I mean, students in this era of, of, of distance learning, um, what I have found to be useful is to allow people to decide what information they want to present. How do they want to be re addressed, um, referred to what information they want to disclose or rather not have disclosed. Um, there's always the challenge and, it's, and it's, it's, it's still one in which I find we struggle with a little bit of um, some some faculty were required in that distance um, format for all students to be on video um, and, and some don't require that. So you have students who are on video, some who are not on video. I think that that is um, still a challenge because it also is an issue of trust. Some faculty feel that if their students aren't on video, they're you know cooking or, providing childcare or doing other things. I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with also now whether it's going to be synchronous or asynchronous education. So there are a whole host of factors, some that are more complex than others um, around this issue of anonymity that I don't think that we have a solid answer for that, or at least I don't have a solid answer for that. I think we're still figuring this out um, and also trying to um, a, a allow some flexibility around this issue. So th that's, that's my perspective and, and my experience thus far. Thank you. I, I agree, it's a, it's a complex set of things. On the, on the one hand, we know that active engagement really is better for learning. And that, um, you know, that we, we spend so much of our energy with active engagement is around eye contact and, you know, being able to look in the classroom and see is somebody paying attention or not, or do they maybe have a question that they're not, you know, there's all, all sorts of things going on. Um, one a colleague from the Graduate School of Design, uh, Architecture, um, uh, professor who's done a lot of um, online teaching in Asia was saying that in some of the programs he's been teaching in, um, they require everybody to be on video, but they also require everybody to have the exact same background. So they provide a background that is exactly the same. Let's just say it's a you know flat gray background. So no matter where you are, you've got that background. And, and it's almost like uh, everybody's wearing a uniform, you know, you're finding some way to, to kind of uh, create some sense of not showing the, the differences that people might be uh, uncomfortable with. Um, I'm not sure what I think about that. I'm not sure that it makes sense in our, in our, um, in our classrooms. Um, I do think it is an issue of trust. I think you're right. You know, it's, it's, do you trust that people are actually paying attention? I can tell you that my son who's 16 doesn't merit that trust on the part of his instructor. He's sitting in front of it with his screen off and his name up there and he's texting his friends. And, you know, I, I think it's, our, our, it's also a level of trust that, that our instructors are gonna make it worth their while to engage because you know sitting and trying to look like you're engaging when someone's droning on for, for um, you know, 50 minutes is also 
uh, tough. So I, I think it is complicated. I think establishing those norms in the beginning, um, demo, you know, saying to students as you're part of this class, active engagement is to your benefit. Here are some ways we can think about it, but help us figure out how to, how to do this in a way that is equitable and that is flexible and allows um, the, the, the very different and very tough experiences that are going on right now. Thank you, thank you. Um, just uh, looking at some more of the Q and A's, um, uh, there was a question uh, from uh, Melinda Levovsky who uh, says she will be embarking on a new journey as a teacher in a private day school uh, where the student population will be more diverse than her previous uh, teaching assignment. Uh, what do you recommend, and these are her words, I read or study in order to prepare for this role in addition to listening to this truly eliminating series of lectures? And I, I feel, I like her question because I think this also applies to uh, faculty in different places. The student body is becoming more and more diverse within public health. How do fac what are the things that faculty can do to um, adapt to that change? Um, Dr. Alexander mentioned uh, Beverly Tatum's book. I think that's, you know, and she's done a recent um, uh, republishing, which I think is is worth looking at. Um, uh, the presidential task force on inclusion and belonging that I was part of a couple years um, that was headed by a couple of people, including Danielle Allen. She did, I thought, a really nice curated list of resources. So it's, you know, there's so many things you could read, but this is a bibliography that's like, you know, maybe 15 or 20 things instead of hundreds and hundreds. And it's, it's available online. Um, the uh, Harvard Task Force on Inclusion and Belonging report. And at the end, or maybe it's an appendix, it has this list of, of resources. Uh, the, other, the other book that I would recommend is, is uh, Dr. Scalia and Sullivan's. Book, I think would be an excellent choice. Um, and I, I think it's a great idea to, to certainly read and, and study. Um, but I also think that a good bit of your learning and adjustment will come with time. Um, and uh, being in that space, recognizing that you have to make a transition. I think this is somewhat um, harkens back to um, a previous comment about, you know, being both inside and outside. Um, I think the outside will definitely be through study of books and other materials, but I think that inside is going to be you recognizing who you are in this new space and giving yourself time and others around you to make that transition. Um, and, and because I think that's where the real authenticity is going to come for you to be able to be effective in, in this new space and to listen and observe and, um, and you know, not be like, um, you know, going in and, and being disruptive, it, disruptive not in a negative sense, but just in terms of, you know, promoting your opinions. Um, I think you may want to resist doing any kind of major, you know, major shaking up um, initially, but just to allow yourself to be and observe and learn and understand the, the culture that you're in, the students you're working with, the colleagues that you're going to spend time with. Um, so I, I, I just want to say that because I do want you to feel that you will get some real understanding and pedagogical understanding and, um, you know, and theoretical underpinning. But I think that the lived experience of being there um, and, and also the experience that you're going to bring from where you are, um, I think will help you tremendously. Dr. Diaclaw? Um, I would also um, suggest reading Carol Anderson's White Rage. 
um, and also reading the large literature on um, the history of independent schools. So I am from Brooklyn. I attended a New York City private school after seventh grade. And so there's a wide literature that I've also contributed to, to the experiences of um, black children and children of color in these spaces. Um, and so I would it, it encourage you to examine that, to, to understand the psychic costs that many students in those spaces have to bear um, and how you can be an advocate um, for these students and their progress um, given your own identity. And I, and I suggest white rage just because there seems to be in our society, and I think this time shows that um, a real lack of knowledge about the history of whiteness as a construct and concept um, and how much that shapes um, those who are diverse and how we think of them or how white people think of them. Um, so I would start there. And I, and I have to tell you, I, I, I was also going to recommend White Rage, but I, I, I couldn't get it out because um, I just talked to a colleague and friend the other day who um, told me about having been in the airport and this, the, my friend is, Afri is an African-American woman and she was in the airport and she was reading White Rage and, um, and a white woman said to her, oh, I'm just so glad you now understand us. And I said to her, what you should have done was to give her say, oh, thank you and give her the book. So be careful where you read the white rage because I think people have this misunderstanding about what this book is really all about. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, so we just have a few minutes left and I want to get to two quick uh, questions. So one for uh, Dr. Diaqua, um, you'd mentioned about the equity audit. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit more about that resource uh, and uh, either description or if there's a place that similar things can be found? Sure, um, that's a resource created in-house. Um, so just thinking about um, what equity looks like for you, what the different uh, identity groups, groups are that you serve at your institution, um, and starting to look at programs um, and policy on every level as well as curriculum, um, creating a sort of rubric that faculty, staff, and students can um, turn to in thinking about their progress. So some resources to get you started, there are a number, there is a, um, a rubric that is adapted, and I cannot think of the citation right now, but it is a continuum um, of moving from a multicultural institution to an anti-racist institution. And I think starting with these kinds of continuums will give you the backbone of the skeleton that you need for creating your own equity rubric or audit. Um, when thinking about creating a resource for your school, it's best that you do not wholesale adapt a resource from another context because the social justice work is context specific. Um, and so if you adapt something that I use, it may not necessarily work for your population. So there's some work that needs to go into co-creating that rubric based on some of the specific issues that face your institution as well. Thank you, thank you. And so I, I think for the final question that I, I that is here, it's really from the point of view of, of students. And we've started to talk about this in um, our discussion about uh, white rage and other um, uh, you know, resources for uh, majority professors uh, to sort of be able to tap in. But uh, this is from a student that um, is only one of three black students in um, an occupational therapy academic program. Um, and she wants to know how to address the need for education on racism in the culture. Many times she's been burdened with the responsibility of educating both peers and professors. And it's truly exhausting, frustrating, and often not rewarding. Um, similar to this question is another <laughs> about um, uh, sort of disrupting white colleague solidarity and how do we get um, other white faculty to use an anti-racist approach again in the curriculum and as a colleague. So, uh, a, you know, a bit of what has been said before, but if there's a kind of a final uh, culminating uh, point that we would like to uh, end this. Uh, oh, 
Well, I'll throw out there that one question that has come up, um, not just here, but in other places is, in public health education, uh, is there a role and a place for uh, a kind of a, a background course in anti-racism, the history of race and racism, history of slavery? Uh, is, is, or is that something that we either need to require people come into the, the, the discipline with? Uh, do we provide it within our curriculum? And again, is it, who's really gonna teach it? Is it for, like should all our faculty be competent in this area? Or is this um, something that we want our students to be competent in, but but our faculty are not? Because sometimes, sometimes we have a disconnect. Students come out of undergrad having taken many of these classes, while as faculty members, we have not. Um, Regine? <laughs> I think that there, you can see me not an emphatically as you speak. Um, so, so we much, we must teach in this country a history of race, racism, whiteness, and white supremacy. Um, it is not a one-time course. So a lot of people are like, do we just teach it and we're done? No, it's been going on for four centuries. So I don't understand how in one course you're gonna understand everything. There needs to be ongoing workshops, trainings, reading books. This, this needs to be a kind of freedom school for everybody, faculty, students, and staff, um, as we are all impacted by this system of racism. And, and we need to refresh this curriculum because racism actually changes the way that it manifests with each generation. And I've done research on this. And so there are times when people cannot recognize the way that racism is manifesting. If we think about Jim Crow, or if we think about reconstruction, we think about the way that racism looks now, there are some key differences. Um, and so this is something that must be required for the field. It must be required for students and staff, and it must be required for faculty. If we are going to change the society, if we really believe that health is a human right, and if we're really serving the public um, as our title says we are, we need to have a history of racism under our belts so we don't perpetuate it. Okay, and uh, Dr. Driver Lynn, you'll get the last word before I have to send it back to uh, Dr. Uh, Sullivan. I don't really want the, the last word, but I wanted to agree and also say, I think international students come into our programs really not feeling equipped to deal with the history of our country and and that there's a kind of if there's part of the course that helps to address that I think it would be important as a school that has a lot of uh, students from all over the the world and, and uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Crozier um, yes. I'm and and I think you know Dr. Lavis um, mm -hmm. now yes. at mm -hmm. Tulane, um, and he is one one voice out there that's saying it should be required for all students. Um, but I agree with um, with Dr. DeQua in, in saying that you know it can't just be students and it can't just be faculty. You know we have staff, we have you know we 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 need to figure out as institutions how to address this. Um, and, you know, yes, we need to have it in our curricula, but we need to have it in the ways in which we run our structures and our institutions. So I, I'm, I believe these conversations are happening um, and there's movement, some more in, in some places than in others. But, you know, I, I really appreciate the question and, um, I, and we are having a conversation in the morning at our institution, um, another conversation where this is being discussed. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wanna thank all of the panelists for your, your wonderful presentations and thoughtful responses. Um, I'll put in one shameless plug for uh, our One School, One Book program, SPH Reads. So all incoming students receive a book mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of try to push this uh, amongst faculty, students and staff as well so that it's reflected in um, all of our conversations. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn this back over to Dean Sullivan um, and uh, Dean Galea for final words. Sure. Thank you. Let me just, uh, can you see my slides? Just wanna put one up. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. That was amazing. And I think I speak for the hundreds of people who joined us in this conversation. You are all amazing. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank uh, our Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, Professor Cozier, fantastic job as always. Yes. And please mark your calendars. We'd love to have you come back for our next session, which is Tuesday, June 9th. We have another panel. We're going to continue the conversation and go deeper. And then we have a third on Wednesday, June 17th. So please mark your calendars. We want to keep this conversation going. And I'll stop there and, and turn it over to Dean Galea. Uh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Yvette. All I want to say is uh, thank you to Dean Sullivan and Cozier. Thank you to all the panelists. One of the great privileges of working in an academic institution is to have the uh, opportunity to learn at all times. It is, um, I feel like like listening to a panel like this, I am I'm learning, I am listening and I am learning. And uh, perhaps uh, as is the case often when you're learning about something is I realize how much I do not know. So thank you all of you, thank you for teaching me. And uh, thank you to um, all the uh, members of the audience who had outstanding questions. Everybody stay well, stay safe. Thank you for joining us. We shall uh, reconvene next week. Bye everybody. Are we still live? Or is that? You are, we are still live. So somebody's got to end the meeting. Well, I wanted to say th thank you again to everyone. Uh, really, that was, that was great. And as Jean Galea said, I, I've learned something. And so I'm definitely going to be in touch with each of you because I took copious notes as you were each presenting. Uh, and so uh, we, should, we, we say this all the time, but we should do we should do something with like this. a yeah a commentary, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. something. And um, yeah. Yeah. We absolutely will. So um, yeah, we'll get some. I, I think everybody was writing notes frantically. So we'll get something together and uh, I think that was great. I mean, we had high hopes and knew you guys would all be great, but I, you all exceeded. Yeah. Uh, as usual, it was really great. So thank you. Yeah. And we need to.